Are you driven by virtues like loyalty and honor, justice and mercy, bravery and self-control? Do superhuman feats of strength, endurance, and perseverance light a fire deep inside your belly? Are you ready to unleash your own special kind of mayhem? Then you've found your game. Join Mark Valenti and his guests as they discuss manliness, mental fortitude, strength and conditioning, history, the wisdom of the past, and all things savage. Hey folks, as you know, I'm a big believer, as a lot of you are, in the ketogenic diet. And today I want to talk to you about a new sponsor to the show, Keto OS. Keto OS, Ketone Operating System, is a revolutionary drink mix based on a proprietary ketone energy technology. It delivers advanced macronutritionals and promotes optimized cellular regeneration, energy, and longevity. The patent-pending active ingredient, beta-hydroxybutrate, is actually ketones that your body will absorb. The drink is delicious and comes in multiple flavors to suit all tastes. This is the perfect supplement for someone trying to adhere to a keto diet. Whether you eat strictly ketogenic or you carb load on some days, this drink will put you directly back into ketosis just by mixing and drinking. You will be in ketosis within 30 minutes of drinking it, and you can test it with a 9-strip or with your blood. So whether you want energy, mental clarity, reduced anxiety, reduced brain fog, better sleep, fat loss, better skin, better appetite suppression, you will get them all with Keto OS. You can check them out online at their website, SinSotoExperienceKeto.com. So that's Sin, C-Y-N, Soto, S-O-T-O, dot ExperienceKeto.com. SinSoto.ExperienceKeto.com. And if you need any help or need any more information, just drop us a line here at the show, blinddoggym at gmail.com. The message is clear to other disturbed kids around the country. If I shoot up my school, I can be famous. The TV will talk of nothing else but me. Experts will try to figure out what I was thinking. The kids and teachers at school will see they shouldn't have messed with me. I'll go out in a blaze of glory. Roger Ebert. Kind of an odd quote from Roger Ebert, but... Uh, so we are in studio today with Lauren Flangella, Lauren Frangella, Allison Hinkle, and Amy Easton, all members here at Blind Dog, and um, all teachers, local teachers in the area. Uh, I heard you guys having a conversation along with a couple other teachers, Jill Williams and and Holly Miller, the other day about what's been going on lately, and I wanted to get this on in a more timely fashion, so we're kind of bumping up when this will be released. Uh, so we're recording this on Saturday morning, uh, and I don't know what date it is, February 24th, and we're going to release it this Wednesday, um, so it's more of a timely thing. The girls are all very <laughs> excited. None of them want to talk on mic right now. But um, with, with the, the, the rash of, of school shootings lately, I wanted to get you guys on and kind of get your opinions on what's going on and what needs to be done and your thoughts on things like arming teachers and, and things like that. My son came home, uh, I think it was Monday or Tuesday last week, and was seriously concerned that there were vulnerabilities in the school and he now all of a sudden is a security expert and you know can see these flaws flaws in the system and where the shooter is going to get in and you know obviously not something we want kids thinking about while they're at school so i don't know uh amy let's start with you what do you i yeah, know she's very excited what what you know you were pretty vocal in that conversation the other day and Yeah, I think that the difference with this event that happened last is that I can really sense the fear in the students. And I have a lot of students telling me, like, I don't feel prepared. Like, I know what to do in Mr. So-and-so's room because we talked about it once, but 
other than that, I don't know what I need to do. And we went through a training, and they, like, we know that you guys know what to do, but we're not being communicated with, and we were just, they feel unprepared, and they feel scared. So what, you went through Al- Alice? Tra- Alice training. Okay. Yeah. And it, we couldn't remember what the acronym was, but was some young basically young what happens in an active shooter situation. Yeah, right? the, um, Alice is an acronym that stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, mm-hmm. Counter, and evacu- Evacuate. God, they're really forcing <laughs> forcing that into an acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically... Um, It was a lot different than what we were always taught before Alice training, which was the school is going to alert us and tell us what exactly is happening. Like they would make an announcement or call your room and say, "There, this is going on, this person is doing this in this hallway, or something similar to that. And then initiate a lockdown. And there are, like Amy was saying, drills and procedures that are in books in our room that describe those. Um... You would go into lockdown. You would be informed by the administration. They have, like, a keyword they come over the... Yes. Okay. Don't they just... There are... Else? I'm sure every school is probably different. <laughs> so my students Running down Alice. the hallway they, screaming, they, Alice. They, they come over the <laughs> announcements and say, Alice, Alice. Okay. Okay, I don't that makes sense. I didn't I go through the training for it. I do think, and that's, yeah, that's something else that I think needs to... is Has been in discussion that... Um, so in this whole announcement process, they're, in, they're supposed to inform us using whatever the code that the school has come up with so that the teachers know, okay, if they say this, this is what I'm supposed to do. And counter and evacuate are like your two active responses. So if somebody comes in and you need to um, counter them by throwing something at them or barricading your door, or, if possible, evacuating, <clears throat> which was not what was always kind of done prior to Our original everybody using Our original was training. always before all this happened. Maybe the training I went through was four years ago, but previous to that, it was turn off your lights, lock your door, and hide all in one desk. little circle yeah. Yeah. or in a corner under your desk, something like that. And then they did a lot of studies looking at Columbine, looking at VTech, mm-hmm. and they've evolved from that. Because the original um, procedure came from, I think they told me, like, Las Vegas shootings, like drive-by shootings, where that would make sense, try to make the building look empty, like, as if nobody's there. But now the attacks, they had to evolve because they're different. Right. So that's where Alice came from, was evolving from what kind of methods we need to use that make sense for the situation. Yeah, I guess, you know, just like any any kind of training or or you know, education you're going to get, they're going to evolve with yeah. with different situations. And you don't, Lauren, you don't get, I, and we're not mentioning anybody's schools in here for obvious reasons. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts and opinions, not your leadership or what, what what's um, going on there. Do you guys still do, Alice? Is that what you're supposed to do? Yes. So yeah, we, like, don't have that. I don't know why. Like, we've done lockdown drills where we <clears throat> hide in a corner and lock oh, the door okay. and turn the lights off. And pretend that we're not in there. But that's it. Like, there's never been. And I did it in one class period. Does that sound odd to you that you would pretend like you're not in there? Like, he's not going to know? Yeah. And the only thing, I was thinking about it this morning, the only thing that we have is we can lock our doors. And we have, like, this magnetic strip that we're supposed to put on, like, the latch of the door frame. And you're supposed to keep your door locked at all times, but, like, when you have the magnetic strip on it, you can still, like, they can open it from the outside, and the strip says lockdown on it. And when there's a lockdown, you pull the strip off, and then the door is locked. So it's supposed to be easier, and you're not going to be struggling with the door, but we have, like, these glass windows right next to it. And it's, like, the one classroom that I'm in, because I share a room, we have, like, a curtain, and you can pull the curtain closed, but then, like... There's nothing, like, it's not safe. Yeah. There's nothing, and we would just hide. There's no closets that we can get into. And you've had a couple, at your school, you've had, I mean, Yeah, I was actually, last year when it happened, I wasn't there. I don't know, like, how I got that lucky, but um, somebody had called. The way that it happened, though, and it's it was very eye-opening, is that they called the police, not the school, Mm -hmm. to call in the threat. So none of 
the school procedures for lockdowns could happen because it was like being controlled by the police instead of they couldn't come over the announcements and say anything. So they couldn't say anything because the person was supposed to be in the school and they were just sending emails to teachers, but they didn't really know what was going on. They couldn't give the teachers all the information because the police were handling it. So the meeting that we had the next day about it was that it was like a false threat and that there's never, like, you have all these drills and all these procedures, but you never know what's actually going to happen, which is scary. Like, it's not always going to be by the book. There's somebody in the school, and this is what we're doing. And that scares me. And you have so many moving parts. I mean, you have teachers who aren't going to be prepared and teachers who are much more prepared and janitors and kids who are always going to be, you know, they're going to surprise you if they're actually prepared for this and and know what to do in that situation. And I can't imagine that any of this is a, a solid remedy for what's going to happen in a real-life situation. Yeah. What's funny to me is that you guys are getting, or we all usually get informed by email. And I don't know about, most teachers aren't at their desk checking their email all the time. I would yeah. guess and you're I probably not supposed to be doing that. Well, right. yeah, not supposed to be. But at some point, there's this expectation that I'm getting it all the time. Mm -hmm. And the students, however, they're getting constantly informed. So they usually know more than we do, right, mm -hmm. on social media. Yeah. And there are all sorts of rumors. Like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. You know, so it's a whole other aspect to it. And I think that's a response <clears throat> of administrators trying to figure out like okay we need to be able to inform these teachers so this is what we'll do and at the time maybe that's their only thought that could be I, I know there was a time at our school where they said teachers you should always have your cell phones on you in case we need to get a hold of you um, and we have cell phones and we have the announcements <clears throat> but maybe it was uh, we had a power outage a couple of times that week or something. So they made a point to say, make sure you have your cell phones on you. Well, my, I don't have the sound on anyway. Right. So <clears throat> it just is like a big change of habit for people. To And that's not what we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're thinking right. about to like check my email right. in case right. there's this email telling me something that I need to know right now. Yeah. Yeah, it would be impossible to, to suspect that. I mean, constantly running over to your cell phone or running over to your computer to see what's going on. And the way that our classrooms are set up, all of them, it's like the door and the glass window and then the, the teacher's desk is right there. So if it's a situation where they're emailing, like if I had been there that day, I wasn't going to be up at my desk. And I can't check my email from the back of the room if I'm hiding in a corner. Like yeah. it's just, it's very unrealistic. And this poor woman was subbing for my class she can't get to the emails and the phone is over there too we have like a classroom phone like i wouldn't be answering the phone if they said that there was somebody in the building and that's the reality of the situation if an actual actual situation is going to occur i mean you're going to have subs in the building and people on right here. Yeah. yeah hey guys let's talk about max straps Steve McCracken has put out these awesome wrist straps that I started using well before he was a sponsor to the show. He sent me these straps, and I beat the crap out of him in the gym. Heavily, overly engineered straps that will really support your lifts. I highly recommend them. Steve is now a sponsor to the show, and we couldn't be happier about that. You can check out his straps and all his other equipment at Max Barbell. That's M-A-C apostrophe S Barbell on Facebook, or drop us a line here at the show. Blind Dog Jim at gmail.com, and we'll get you in touch with Steve. Great wrist straps, great people. Definitely. People who aren't, you know, part of the team, quote unquote, every day and know, wow, yeah. I wonder if they could create some kind of app on your phone that would override your, your and it probably already is out there, but, you know, override the fact that your sound is off. Yeah. And it would be something where well, you get like, a job as a teacher. Like and, alerts. Don't they come out right, on your phone? Those things scare the crap out of me when they come out. Because my yeah. phone's never, it's always on vibe. Well, they right. did kind of similar to what happened in Hawaii, right? I mean, that yeah. wasn't an amber alert, but that was an alert God, that yeah. came yeah. on everybody's or phones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, that's obviously a possibility. You're talking about that there was a missile missile yeah. launch. Oh <laughs> so you had 32 minutes where I people... Like three people that were in Hawaii at that time. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, they, they sent out a... 
a missile, a missile, you know, some kind of missile launch has happened, take cover, and for 32 minutes they didn't come back on to say, hey, this isn't really happening, and right. I can't even imagine people the drama in the that would... and stuff, so or manholes? I've got this friend who owns a gym in, uh, in Hawaii, it's called 50 Barbell, and uh, it's funny, during the alert, he's got a video of him, and he, he's, his people, it's a great gym, because it's like in the driveway of his house, so it's Hawaii. So they're all like lifting in bikinis outside, and you know they, they're never. There's no indoors, so he takes a video of himself looking at his phone where it says, you know, missile launch, take cover. People are just still working out. <laughs> it's like if I'm going out, I'm going out the way I want to. So, but people, I mean, I can't even imagine what goes through your brain. But yeah, I wonder if they could come up with something where, you know, you get a job with the school, or even if you're a substitute for your school, you log into the app and you're in there for the day. You that know? makes sense. Yeah, technology's out there. Right. Yeah, you could probably talk to one of the kids you actually work with who could figure something yeah, out better sure. than we could. You yeah. know. Um, it's really interesting that um, Lauren and I live in or teach in neighboring districts, and our procedures are so different. Yeah. Right. You know, that's really interesting to me. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, my school is so big. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. like 2,000 kids there. And let's face it, it's a little bit more violent yeah. than what, what Amy and, and right. uh, Allison deal with. So, I don't know. It's Amy just, lives in a straight hood school, man. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I said that. Lori didn't say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just there's so many kids at our school, and they, I feel like they can't keep track of them most of the time. Yeah. Like, there's kids wandering around all the time, and they have, like, a piece of paper. They say, like, oh, it's passed. Nobody checks. But I just, like, I get nervous because I don't want my kids out in the hallway, but they're just skipping class, whatever, and they don't think – that, like, there's a reason your teachers don't want you in the hallway all day long. Right. Not only should you be learning, but if you're supposed to be in my class and you're not there, I'm responsible for you. Yeah. I'm supposed to know where you're at. I don't know. It's- now, do you guys have school resource officers there? I we not. have We have one. And he's armed? Yeah. I honestly don't know much about him. I don't know if he's always there. Or right. if he's there occasionally. I feel like lately he's probably been there more often. I saw somebody yesterday, like a cop. Right. And that's, like, specific to your school or to the district? I know, you don't like, know? there was one that was specific to our school, but I I don't know if he's still there. I don't, I don't know. We used to have D.A.R.E. officers. I think right as I was um, graduating, they used to have D.A.R.E. officers. So you'd have, like, a guy from the sheriff's department there, and I think he was... They would do, like, drug searches and stuff yeah. like that, but I think it was a... I, I, don't, I don't know where the, where the income comes or the, where the funding comes for something like that, but... Yeah, I, I, I grew up in Amherst, and I remember there being a resource officer there the last... At least my last couple... They have one? It's, it's when I was there, I graduated... To? No, when I graduated in 2003 from Amherst, I think the last couple of years there was a resource <laughs> officer, and if I remember right, he was armed. Right, but I could. Be I think that. I think they were armed when I was there too, and it was like a local sheriff's department guy um, doing it. But I'm not. I'm not sure. But yeah, obviously that we're not having them in schools as much anymore, and definitely yeah. not in every school. You guys have them. We have we have one resource officer who I believe is the resource officer for the whole district, but where all of our schools are on one campus. So he could get to any school if he needed to. It yeah, it's really very quick. quickly. Yeah. Um, I also know that this week the um, the police department contacted the school saying we are going to have um, uh, an officer who is just driving around. Somebody will be in your school three times a day. Okay. Out of like those who are on the road. Yeah. So aside from the resource officer, my community has kind of. And you live in, in, in the community where your school is, is um, very, it's the same same community that I live in, and it's very small, mm-hmm. um, very inactive. There's not a lot going on. Um, so I think it would be a little bit easier for those police officers to come in as opposed to where Lauren's at, sure. and they're dealing with, you know, a lot of heroin in the streets and violence of other kinds. Yeah. and. Yeah, I know, like, when there have been threats, 
there's a significant amount of police at school. But, and they walk around in, like, their bulletproof vests, and it's it's scary. The one after it happened last year it was right before finals. And when we do finals, you have to sit, like, one period you have to sit in the hallway and be, like, a hall monitor, basically, to keep kids out of the hall. And I'm just sitting at this desk, like, grading papers, and there's two cops walking by in bulletproof vests, and I'm like, am I safe here? Like, yeah. should I be in the hallway? Is this okay? But... Normally, I think there's one resource officer there most of the time. Yeah. I'm sure now it's a little bit more often. And didn't that let, last year, didn't they, they lock you down for almost eight hours? No, it wasn't until, it was, it happened at like 1130, I think, and it went till three. Okay. Something. It wasn't, they weren't there for more okay. than they should have been for a regular school day. Okay, yeah. Still, that's a long time to sit in a classroom and not yes. be able to go to the bathroom. Yes, and, that was wow. a problem for people, definitely. Um, teachers were, like, peeing in garbage cans and stuff. Not in front of the kids. But right. <laughs> and that's why, like, I always, if I feel like I, this is probably not, if I feel like I have to go a little bit, I will, like, not say that I can hold it. I'm like, i got to go right now. So now you know Lauren's bathroom habits <laughs> in school. It's very interesting. Um <laughs> How does that work? Are you, I mean, do you call another teacher to watch your class? Or? Like normally? Yeah. Like if you have it's to go to the bathroom. I or? never leave my class. I'll go and be like a second late to class if I can trust the students. There's students who my kids are crazy. And if I'm like in walking in as the bell rings, they're like, where were you? Why mm-hmm. weren't you here? Guys, calm down, please. But sometimes I'll ask a teacher to watch yeah. my class. I can trust We're supposed most of my to. Kids. I yeah. gotta say, it would be a 15 minute process to call mm-hmm. down, get someone to cover. Right. I just go, you know. Yeah. So hope for the best. Yeah, hope yeah. for the best. Yeah. Just like like we don't else. be killing each other when I come back in. Yeah. yeah. No, you're, no, you're, you know, you're right. There's certain so classes that I would not be. can do that with. And Amy Lord, you guys work with high school, right? Yes. yes. And then, mm-hmm. and, and Allison works with the, I don't know, what is it? Are they, are they technically junior high or what? I don't know no, what they it's are. Technically a middle school. Middle school. I should know. My son is in the school, so <laughs> I don't. Know. We have to sit down and have a talk about grades, and I still don't understand how he's being graded. I'm just <laughs> waiting for next year when I get A, Bs, and Cs and mm-hmm. stuff like that. I know what's going on. I get it. Um, so there's been a lot of, and, and this is the thing: is when these incidents come come out. I was Googling last night how many actual school shootings have been in 2018. And you'll see some people who say there's been eight school shootings, and some will say 18. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't narrow it down to, do they mean the 2017-2018 school year so far? But what I got for sure is there has been eight documented since the beginning of 2018. So maybe that's where we focus right now. But regardless, in seven weeks, we've had eight shootings. That's a huge uptick in, in what's going on. Do you guys see, do you, do you have any feeling as to why this is becoming more prevalent? Or why are we seeing it more? Is it, is it a human interest story more? Or do we think there's actually an uptick in violence among kids? I, I don't know. That's like such a deep question because it could come it's from. It's all about these deep questions on the show, Lauren. <laughs> um, I don't think like people are saying video games are so violent, but I don't think that that has anything to do with it. Maybe not. I don't know. But um, I, it could be like a mental health thing. Kids aren't getting the help that they're supposed to, but everybody is also so much more sensitive now. That could be an issue too. But school isn't, even from when I was in high school, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. There's so much more testing and the kids are going to school and learning to take the tests. You said, uh, one of you said that guidance counselors, that's pretty much all they do now? They do, Yeah. Because There's when I was there, they were there to talk to. and A lot of the administrative tasks are being put on to the guidance counselors because there's so much more of it with all the documentation and the testing and the loopholes they have to jump through. So Is now they do scheduling, they do um, testing. I mean, we, my guidance counselor, we had a meeting last week, and she's like, hey, guys, 
send the kids down if you can really tell they're in crisis situation. But otherwise, just have them fill out the form and promise them we'll talk to them. But it might not be right now because we're in testing season right now. Wow. I mean, that's just that, that that's blows sad. my mind. Yeah, and we've had two guidance counselors leave in the last few years with that complaint is like I'm not doing the job I came in to do. Like I don't get to do mental right. health. Who goes into guidance to be a guidance counselor so they to can do count tests and right. to make sure the regulations. It's really sad. And the kids are not they're falling through the cracks. Yeah. They're falling through the cracks I think because they're not getting the the guidance counseling, for example, is one of them. But the other thing is just the the testing in the curriculum. These um Warren and I are lucky because we teach non tested areas. So mm-hmm. I have some more flexibility. I don't have the government or a test breathing down my neck, like you have to teach A, B, C, D, and E. Right. And if I, ha- I have more wiggle room, but the science, the math mm-hmm. teachers, if you're in a tested area, you are glued to this curriculum. And like teacher down the hall and the other science teacher, like they're doing the exact same thing the exact same day, giving them the exact same test. So you have a, a student or a class that has this conversation they want to have or something that maybe you want to address. Like they just don't have the autonomy to teach holistically and teach right. to students as much as they used to before. What, now, did that come from No Child Left Behind? Is that Bush's thing? That was the beginning of it, I would say. Yeah, I don't I don't know. You guys are probably too young to remember all that legislation. No, that was, that was the thing in the beginning. Yeah. 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 But, it has um, evolved into yes. more. Like, it's yeah. a bigger monster than it used to yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, even in the past 10 years, because when I was in high school, we didn't have... I remember taking the OGT and going and taking the ACT. Right. And that was it. Like, mm-hmm. in high school, it was not... But now, it's that's all they talk about, is mm-hmm. air testing, and I don't even February, know. March, and April, I see my students not very often, because they're always being taken out to test. Yeah. Or really? just this email I got in our Friday flyer. Um, hey, teachers, go do this practice test as often as you can. Like, don't teach your lessons. Go practice how to take the test. Like... That's a legitimate thing coming from our principals that we just we teach to that test so that our our district shows the good scores right and we get the funding or whatever it is that we, we need to get those good scores on our reports. Now, do private schools like St. Edwards would they have to go through that all that same stuff or do um, they have a little bit more wiggle room? I'm pretty room? sure. Private schools, yes. Charter schools, no. From what I understand. If they receive government funding, I believe they have to do some. So, like J- Jay Sayez works at a charter yeah. school out of Sandusky, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, seeing as a, a school like that would still, they would receive funding from uh, Lakewood, I guess, or Cleveland, mm-hmm. or wherever the school is. Uh, it depends on the students that they have in the school if they get the funding or not. Um, but they they will hold to those standards mostly because, especially with the high schools. They want to make sure that they're accredited for their students to be able to get into college and yeah. things like that. <clears throat> um, I'm currently getting my master's in school counseling. Um, and this last class that I took um, was all about building a school counseling program, mm-hmm. which as a teacher, I don't know anything really about mine. I would wonder, do you know, either of you have a lot of information or knowledge about the school counseling program that exists in your school. I didn't know that was a thing until Mm -hmm. I learned about it. And um, there is an organization, the American School Counselor Association, and they have, like, a guide, basically, for school counselors um, that says the school counselor to student ratio should be 250 students to one counselor. And I don't... I couldn't find a national average, but um, the... The highest to the lowest school con- student to counselor ratio is 924 students to one. Wow. Um, which would maybe be like one in a district, one student That's in a, so, well, yeah. maybe not. Um, the lowest was 202 students to one. And the lowest. Mm-hmm, wow. Yeah, that was in Vermont. Um, and Ohio's in 2014 to 2015, there was 462 students to one counselor on average, in schools. And I think that this is kind of the start of where the problem is. Yeah. Because all of the things that Amy was talking about with the um, uh, testing and the things that the counselors are 
being given the responsibility of carrying out and what tasks they're being given. Um, aside from the fact that if there is no administrator present, then they step up as the administrator. They're like the backup administrator. Right. So they have all of these roles that are technically non-counseling roles from what I'm being taught. I think this is a little bit of a change, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I think teachers would recognize, students definitely would recognize, um, all ages of students, that we have all these students who are afraid or who are having uh, mental health issues, and the counselors have to say, well, fill out this form first. Right. And think about from the counselor's perspective. I, I was reading this thing, and I don't remember the name of the, the theory, but there's a theory that because of our primitive brains and we lived in small tribes that were only programmed to be able to associate and know 150 people. So if you have a regular human uh, school counselor yeah. who has 900 kids on top of the 150 people she deals with on a normal basis that are part of her clan, her tribe, how is she supposed to delve into the these mm -hmm. intricate signs of a kid maybe going off the rails when she can't, there's no way she could possibly even remember all their names. Right. I'm thinking my class, I have 160 students, and I see them 52 minutes a day in groups of like 20 to 30 kids. Right. And I don't know, the, I mean, that's a big group in order to get yeah. to know, and they don't see them every day. They really count on the teachers to like, hey, so-and-so, there's a red flag here, there's a red flag there, and they kind of culminate that sort of thing, but they're not seeing these kids on a day-to-day right. -day basis. It's, and they're also not seeing the students who aren't going to show up as red flags. Right. The ones who aren't right. saying anything to anyone about it may sometimes be the ones who need something the most. And counselors should ideally serve every single student. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if they're on this end or this end of, of whatever spectrum we're talking about. Everybody in the middle just gets missed because they don't need something right. immediately. And that is part of the problem, perhaps. Yeah, I think, like, at my school, the only time that a kid goes to the counselor without themselves going to the counselor is if their grades are slipping and a teacher has brought it up or like something happens in the classroom that a teacher thinks this is kind of weird maybe they should talk to a counselor or if they're skipping class so if they're not showing those three signs there's no way to know yeah wow yeah so <sighs> so there's so many so we <laughs> When we were talking, Aaron and I were just down in Mexico and uh, dealing with, with the immigration problem in, in the United States today. So you have one side who's vehemently against letting Mexicans come up through the through the border. And the other side is like, oh, you know, let them come. And there's, but there's so many issues in between that. You know, we went to Progreso and you saw this level of poverty that was amazing to me. Like, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. So you can't look at these people and go, oh, no, you can't come to this shining city on the hill. You know, but, you know, other people say, well, they come to the country and, you know, they're not being taxed and they're taking all our jobs. Well, then, you know, you have to go back and do things like fix the tax code and look at legalizing drugs so there isn't that problem. It's not just, oh, you can't keep these people out of the country. It's ridiculous. We're going to build a big, giant fucking wall. Um, but... And this is the same thing. So you're, you're looking at violence in schools. And now all of a sudden, it's, it, what, what irritates me to know, Anna, is as soon as it comes out, it becomes a gun issue. Yes, we take everyone's guns away. No, you can't take my guns away because some guys who wrote with feathers 200 years ago said that, you know, you can have all the guns you want, which is, they're both insane. But when you look at things like there's no mental health for these kids at all, and you guys are being forced into these little boxes where you're you're going through a uh, a template of how to teach these students instead of actually getting to have some kind of bond with them and actually know oh there's something wrong with this kid he's not acting like he did two weeks ago hey what's going on you know because if you if you get out of that loop for two seconds now you're a week behind on what you're supposed to be doing right yeah there's um this new movement that has happened over like the last few days um, after um, certain proposals have come out where um, 
I, I feel like basically right now, after every time this happens, like you're saying, there's all these fingers pointing, mm -hmm. saying it's this, it's the fault of this or this group or this thing. And so it's pointed at the NRA who points it, the finger at all of these other areas, the FBI, school security, uh, mental health. And they're all, it's all a big ball. It's like a, all it's like a rubber band ball. Yep. It's like you can't peel it apart to figure out how it goes together. It's right. the fault of all of it. Right. And we can't just keep pointing fingers and sitting there complacent because then complacency becomes like another weapon almost. And that's what they're doing. So they keep you guys all arguing with each other yeah. and then nothing gets done. And then all you'll move on to, goes away, yeah. yeah, Kim Kardashian gets, you know, a new ass cheeks or whatever, and no one's paying attention to the problem anymore until another one happens and we have nine. Yeah. Um, because now you kind of expect it. You expect it. It's coming. Just a matter of... And, right. uh, you know, like I was trying to... Hayden is really weirded out about it, but I guess if you look at it with the amount of schools we have at all levels nationwide, yes, it's a very small percentage, but any kind of problem like this is a big deal. I mean... Eight shootings in seven weeks is is way beyond what I've ever seen before. And I think there's a lot of repercussions, whether it happens close to you mm -hmm. or however far away Florida is from us, right. it ripples out. And I'm sure every one of us has felt it at our schools that there are other kids who have the same thoughts come up because... They've seen it in the news, or mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Kind of like a copycat thing. Yes. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, I know for a fact place. you had, what, four? I mean, not... I'll say at least. Yeah. You had at least four incidences of people either threatening to shoot, or I know one lady here at the gym, or even her son got threatened. They were going to shoot him, you know? And, mm -hmm. and then those, those threats become suspensions, mm -hmm. but... Then what happens to those kids when they're suspended? That those are the kids that the counselor should be talking to, right? Sure. But they're at home. I don't know. I don't know if there is a protocol for that. But in my mind, while it is this like intertwined ball of all of these different things that play a part in this, if we can't serve these students and help them, whether they're your son who's afraid or this kid who has these thoughts, they all need to be taught how to deal with their emotions. Sure. And and whatever that method is to, to be able to deal with that, to know what to do if I'm afraid, to, build, to develop a plan. What do I do if I have this thought? Who's teaching these kids that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's um, I saw an article last night that irritated me, and I did what I do so often on Facebook, is I saw the article and it irritated the crap out of me and I posted it. I posted my opinion on it and then I went back a half hour later and deleted it <laughs> because I didn't want to hear anybody else's opinion on it. <laughs> um, but it was a, it was a uh, guy who was saying that um, the reason why we're having all these mass shootings now is because uh, boys are broken and they need to take a lesson from the feminist movement and learn how to be more sensitive and express their feelings more. And I thought to myself, you didn't see this shit happen in, in the 1960s. I mean, girls are girls and boys are boys. I, and for me, I think the problem is we have less men in the home and staying with their boys and teaching them how to be honorable and courageous and chivalrous and, and kind. And So moms are doing the absolute best they can to raise these kids, but... It would be similar to me to raising a little girl. You know, with your little girls, I, I would know the first thing to do with them, from doing their hair to what kind of feminine medical problems they have. I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's a, another huge part of this aspect is that we don't have as many dads sticking around. Um, I know when I worked at the DH and we had uh, all these kids coming in constantly, especially for violent acts, there was never a father in the house. You know, there was no father in their lives. And I'm talking 90% of them. You know, I think that's one of the things is, you know, you need someone outside. Your job as, I mean, 
legitimately your job as teachers is to educate the students. It's not to teach them or give them a moral compass or teach them the right way to live their lives. I mean, you do that as teachers, yeah, but that's not your job. Flexibility. That's, I think the majority of teachers go into teaching for that, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we're nurturers, yeah. and we want the flexibility to be able to do that. Does that make, you know, and I yeah, think I that's been that taken too. away from a lot of teachers. It mm-hmm. also kind of stifles your artistic ability, absolutely, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got to get rid of these standardized testing. I, you know, Hayden freaked out about that. You know, if I don't pass this test, I'm not going to be able to move on to this grade. Like, whatever, dude. You know, you'll be fine. And you know, but he was he was weirded out when that was going on. What is um? Does your union or do you guys have any uh, knowledge of what? Does your union fight for this stuff? Like more school security, more. Is that something that can be brought up with shop stewards or is that how you guys you guys work shop stewards or nothing like that? No. No. It's usually getting our next contracts and the um, stipulations in our contracts. Uh, and they're usually taking things away and we're asking for them back and uh, we, I guess the idea is that we get what we need and we're compensated the right way. You're going to get good teachers that can do a good job. Uh, but I've never heard any talk about that sort of thing. I think there may be, um, there is a lot of different personnel. I mean, a school district has however many teachers and even just like at the lunch table where there's eight of us. There's a lot of different opinions. Mm -hmm. So I think when there's a contract that affects everybody, we have to fight for this and this and this is the conversation. But when this comes up, I think people are afraid. I mean, they'll talk about it, but I think sometimes you keep a little bit of your opinion in. Yeah, Because of the reactions that you're going to get. And so, I don't know, maybe that's why we don't have that. Because they do fight for stuff when they feel that it needs to be fought for. But... I don't know why why that wouldn't come up now then. Well, you know, schools are so, we're always nickel and dining mm-hmm. with our contracts. Um, and the funding is a huge issue all the time. So if you throw in something like, let's get metal detectors, let's get resource officers, where is it coming from? Yeah. Like, it's it's not, obviously we're not. Well, they have to find a new way to fund us. schools to begin with this funding's a big issue. With the I don't know if they do it nationwide like this, but with the passing of levies every couple of years, I mean no, come it's on. Unconstitutional. It is, it's yeah. Means, uh, it's really terrible. And then they'd say that the lottery goes to schools, which is horse shit, because mm-hmm. you get very little of that money yeah. going towards schools. Yeah, I mean so many issues are wrapped up in that. And then when you look at I have I I and the whole point of Refined Savage is that my opinions have changed drastically over the years from, from where I was. And, and this is the way it should be. You know, you know, my opinions when I was in my thirties as opposed to now are totally different. And I'm a gun owner and I always tell Aaron, we have a gun for the zombie apocalypse. You know, a meteor strike hits the planet. I've got a weapon, but it's locked up and the bullets are not with the gun. And the, you know, the key is for the, I don't know where the hell the key is. And you know, if an intruder broke in my house, there's nothing. I'm gonna grab a baseball bat. There's no nowhere I'm gonna get that gun out. But we live in an area that is gun heavy. I mean, there are people in this gym who have safes full of guns in their house. And um, you know, one of the things is, well, we need to be able to, you know, the Second Amendment says that we sh- we uh, have the right to bear arms. Well, you know, the Constitution is a fluid document that has been amended over years and years and years. And I don't think any of them could have foreseen the fact that we were going to be having AR-15s and they were going to be in the hands of irresponsible children with with low brain power and bad psychological counseling. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the, you know, Andy Stumpf, who is a former Navy SEAL, had one of the best uh, takes on this. The people who say that, well, we we need these guns to to um, prevent a a takeover from an out-of-control government. And he said, you know, first of all, the police and the military are the good guys, number one, in 99% of the situations. But that the government has predator drones and nuclear missiles and tanks and A-10 Thunderbolts and all. 
Your machine, machine gun is not going to help you. Out. Absolutely. At this point. Yeah. So that argument just goes out the window right there. You are not going to defend yourself from an out-of-control government. Mm-hmm. If the government goes out of control, you're screwed. Mm-hmm. I don't know the way to get, get machine guns out of the hands of people, but I think there needs to be drastic repercussions if your child takes your gun and does something like this, like jail time for you, because you have screwed up. I am very confident that, you know, my kid is number one educated to stay the hell away from my gun. And even if he screws up, he's not going to be able to get the gun and get it unlocked and find the bullets. And You know, mm-hmm. I'm doing the best I can to make sure that that zombie apocalypse, apocalypse gun stays out of the hands of my kid. Um, Did you conceal, uh, well, when you worked at the... DH, were you concealing? No, no, no. no. Okay. And it would be weird because I don't have a CCW, um, and I never begin. I don't want to be that guy. Oh, I'm going to Target. I have to strap my gun on my hip like I'm Wyatt Earp. You know, I don't want to be that guy. But um, I would walk into the mall or something, and kids, hey, Mr. V, what's happening? You know, and I may have just beat this kid up a couple weeks ago to drag him into his cell, but. You know, you just kind of had to deal with it. But a lot of guys did. A lot of guys had their CCWs and Mm -hmm. were carrying outside. But But it wasn't part of your job? No. With uh, gun training and stuff like that? We didn't get, we didn't even get mace, like tear gas until like, I was probably 16 years into the job, you know, it was all just wrestling with guys. But That's interesting, just thinking about the suggestion for teachers to have guns and you're doing your job. What do you think about that? I think it's a terrible idea, I do too. and I think I I've, I've heard a couple of voices online saying very few saying it's a good idea, but I would say in my school, like a hundred percent of us think it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't heard I a teacher say heard. it's a good idea yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Facebook comments, I've heard like a couple of voices, but yeah. it's not common. You look at someone like Isaac, okay, who was trained to do that, and his whole career was was built around being calm enough in a situation. Mm-hmm. And having the right mindset that he could take someone out in a situation where all hell is breaking loose. And instead, I'm going to give a gun to one of you and say, hey, keep this in your desk. And in the rare case that in sometime in your 30 years, someone breaks into your school and wants to kill you, you're going to be able to take that gun out, take the safety off, rack one in the chamber and put a round in them from 50 feet away. What the fuck? The um, the Alice training that we did, I forget what sheriff it was, but I think it was the sheriff of Lorraine. He was uh, very anti-conceal and carry for civilians. And he said that our train, and I might have this uh, percentages wrong, but it's something along the lines of a trained officer, like in target practice, 70% accuracy, yeah. but in a high situation practice where you're, or a situation where you're losing your extremities, the blood flows to your base, 20% yeah. for a trained person. Well, I went with, when I learned yeah. to shoot my gun, I went with uh, Mike Kale, who was on Cleveland SWAT. And I figured, if I'm going to learn how to do this, I'm going to learn from the right guy. And, um, and he was amazed at how accurate I was. He was like, you're, you're way better than half the guys I shoot with. And I wasn't that accurate. And he said, can you imagine why you see these videos now? And, the, you know, there's these shootouts where the cop unloads 15 bullets and never hits anything because he's so freaked out. Right. And I'm sure if I was in a situation where shit was coming at me, I would not be as accurate as I was there. Mm-hmm. So to, to think you guys are going to be able to, or anyone, it just, it, it always spooks me out, even to this day when I see someone in Target with a gun on their hip, you know? Mm-hmm. Because always- if you think you're going to take someone down, you're aiming for... Uh, the intruder or whomever, and you're going to miss, yep. most likely, and hit an innocent bystander. Yeah. And another thing that would happen, part of our training was, if you disarm the intruder, do not hold on to that gun. Like, get rid of it. Put it under a garbage can. Get away. Because when the SWAT comes in, right. they see you with the right. gun, they're, you're going down. Right. Yeah. They're going for you. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I You know, these people talk about having an AR-15 for home de- defense. You know, I think about my house set up and if an intruder comes up my stairs and I'm standing in my bedroom with my machine gun and I decide to take a shot at him and I don't hit every single shot in him and it stays in that intruder's body, it's going right through my son's bedroom. Uh-huh. You know? And I don't <laughs> just don't understand how any of these are legitimate arguments to keep machine guns in the hands of people. You yeah. know? Well and on top of that, I think they're 
uh, like all the teachers we know, um, a lot of teachers are, do not think that we should be carrying guns. We don't want to. That's right. not what we right. went to college for. That's not what we signed up to do. We're nurturers. We're not going to carry a gun for that purpose at our job. That's not what we feel comfortable doing. And there, I know it was started by two teachers, but there um, was a movement that I know you two are seeing more because maybe because you're in the high schools, but um, teachers are posting things with the hashtag arm me with. And so it's basically saying, don't arm me with guns, arm me with this something else. Um, so I know you mentioned yesterday something about arm me with glue sticks. Yeah, some of them are like arm me with glue guns and not regular guns or something like that. Or like arm me with, some of them are really good, arm me with more smaller class sizes so I can get to know my students. Or arm me with um, like better, less testing, like what we talked about, less testing and guidance counselors that can focus on their jobs. With resources, so you can yeah, resources. you can educate your children. Right, the ones right. that have been um, shown the most in the media are the ones who are asking for those things that kind of relate back to that school counseling program. I need more resources. I need to teach my kids um, social emotional skills. They need. Uh, I need smaller class sizes so that I can build relationships with my students. And um, similar to like how you saw the kid from the DH in Target, and he's like, hey, Mr. V, yeah. you must have developed a relationship with that kid, or he wouldn't be saying, hey, Mr. Yeah. V, um, when you threw him in his cell last week. And we cannot make those close relationships. We can't find that kid who doesn't say anything mm -hmm. and figure out what is going on with them right. if we have 30 kids in the classroom. Right now, my um, contract has no, no, um, no cap on classroom size. Wow. And that doesn't mean that they will just throw 50 kids in my class because they say they won't. But, I mean, that is that is a real thing. And teachers don't want to be armed with guns. They want the resources that we should have as a school. And they want a safe school. And they want their kids to be taught what they should be taught. And they may not be receiving at home or from their counselors. Yeah. And I'm guessing that just out of a abundance of work, the kid who isn't talking very much in school is the one you don't worry about because he's not the kid interrupting your class and throwing shit at you and, you know, Absolutely. but he might be the one you need to w look at the most. You just probably don't think about that stuff, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's so many different parts, again, just like immigration that need to be addressed. And I have less than zero confidence in anyone in any administrative position as far as government that is actually going to put forth any effort to solve this. And I don't know what the issue is because I can't imagine going to the, the polls in November and electing someone who's going to take the reins and go in and, and they're just going to get bogged down in this quagmire of bullshit that is so deep and ingrained in our government that there's nothing that can be done about anything, you know? I think it's kind of cool right now with the students taking a very grassroots movement. Yeah. A lot of people are talking about it. Yep. Um, and it's coming from those students mm -hmm. and yeah. people supporting them. Uh, there's, yeah. like, a couple of walkouts that are planned to be happening. I think March 17th, which is the Women's Day March, I think they're supporting that. And then there's another planned one uh April 20th, which is right. the anniversary of Columbine. Are these nationwide things? I suppose those are. To be, yeah. Yeah. And so they're encouraging teachers and students to walk out. And there is word on the street at my school that they're planning one on Tuesday. And so we had a meeting in the morning, like, just so you know, like, some students might be walking out. Like, he was telling us how he would like us to approach this. And like, we're going to support them. We want them. They're afraid. They want, I mean, we're in the same boat as they are. Sure, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times you guys hear a bang in the hallway, whether it be like a desk or a chair, and my first thought every time is, oh my God, and the kids more so, you yeah. know, like there's fear. Um, so, but the students, they were shocked, like, wait, you're going to support us? Like, you're going right. to walk out with us? And I think, so the students are doing this grassroots movement, and the adults are getting behind them, and their, their voice as well, we're going to be voting, you know, we're not 18 yet, but we're going to be soon. So that's encouraging to me. I would, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could get someone who is like the head of education, who is actually an educator, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. It would be a miracle. Oh my gosh. You know, 
uh, when they were when they put uh, uh, Mad Dog Matus in as the the Secretary of Defense, and that, that's a, a big no no that you have a. But to me, it was like, who would know this job better than someone who's done it his whole career? Been in the trenches, right? So, so why don't we have mm-hmm. some teacher who has gone through the trenches and and done all this? I don't know. I I think we need to get less and less politicians in there and more and more people who've done the job and get some Elon Musk guy to be the head of of whatever and you know bring these guys in who actually have some background and some intelligence. I'm so tired. I had to unplug. I, I haven't had an actual TV in my house for I think four or five years now, just because. It was just so much, you know. And then you go over to my parents' house, and Fox News is blaring at, you know, ungodly levels. and just like Sean Hannity screaming at you from the television <laughs> set. Um, uh, yeah, if we could just, I think you're right. I think a grassroots effort to, to change some of this stuff. But it can't stop when they give you just a little token Oh, we're going to do this for you. You know, you just got to keep grinding and keep. Yeah. And that's how they that's how they ended the Vietnam War was just they just kept grinding and kept fighting for that. Yeah. And I've seen stuff like that it was student like college students and high school students that were fighting for the civil rights movement and stuff like that. And so I feel like these kids they have so and people are saying on Twitter and stuff there, there's no way that it's just these kids that are doing all of this. Like they have help from people but they're saying it in a bad way, like they shouldn't be getting help from people. Right. But they have, I mean, celebrities are like donating to them, and they're they were on Ellen yesterday, I think, and like, I think our kids need to see that that what they're, what these kids are doing is it's possible for them to do too, and really, it's social media that's making it possible. Like these kids are on Twitter calling out politicians, right? And it's awesome. And, and they're like guys like me who have no fucking idea how right. to stop that. Oh, my God, I'm getting called out on Twitter. How does that yeah. – what happens now? You it's know? so awesome, and I think that my kids need to see that. I have one student who – I just feel so bad for him. He's, like, very affected by the environment. Like, and I talked to him about – it was when the um, the Internet thing was going – I can't remember what it was called. The – when they're – the ban on the Internet, like, they're trying to – oh. Yeah, net neutrality. Net neutrality, right. And he, I mean, he's, I think he's a sophomore, and he was like, I'm just so sick of hearing about our government, like, failing us and doing mm-hmm. all these bad things, like, they don't care about us. And then, like, for him to see these kids, I was talking about it with him the other day, and he's like, this is awesome. I feel like we can make a difference now, and it's it's great. Like, I think, I think those kids are really good role models for well, when our you, kids. Well, when you look, when these people in general, and kids might be the, the way the wave of this, when you understand that the only thing keeping the government running the way it's running is tradition. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's nothing to this. You don't need to find, you know, when it's voting day, you don't need to have to go find your voting booth and, and, and leave work early. We have the internet. You can make it very easy for people to vote. You know, these legislators who, represent, you know, thousands and thousands of people and they go to Congress and instead of doing what their their constituents want, they do whatever lobbyist has told them they want, you know. But you don't need that. You have this now where you can you could do everything. Oh, you want to go to war in Syria? No, I'm gonna vote against that, you know, and you don't need all this stuff now. So the only thing keeping all this bullshit alive is tradition. You know, yeah. this is the way we do things and we are a group of 60-year-old baby boomers who, this is the way we do things, and we're going to keep doing it that way. And hopefully that next generation comes up will start to get rid of some of these people. And I'm sure it's always been that way. But these these hippies who were the change they wanted to see in the 60s are now the, the people in power that are holding down the establishment, and this is the way it's going to stay, and we're not going to change for anything, and... That's really interesting to me. Interesting. This upcoming generation gets a lot of criticism when yeah. you think about like millennials and Even their work us. ethic and thing, things like that. But they are definitely a creative bunch, mm-hmm. and they are they tend to be more compassionate mm-hmm. due to the social media. They see more things or like internationally, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And so they tend to have more compassion, and they're very 
creative. So I'm hopeful for them in that. In I, that yeah, way. people bust on the millennials all the time. In, in my age group, especially, you know, I have people who are friends of mine who are always posting these anti-snowflake things. And it's like, we don't understand. I'm 44 years old. I don't understand them. It doesn't mean they're assholes or they're bad people. They're just different they're than bad. me, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And running a business, I'm trying to connect with those people and figure out what makes them tick so I can give them my service, which I think they absolutely goddamn need, but I'm not going to be able to do it in the way that I do it with people who are in my age bracket. There's just, you have to find that, that thing we can connect with to, to relate and whether that's me trying to get them into the struggle of training or you guys teaching them I mean, there's nothing different about the millennial generation that's different than any other generation coming up. They're just young and stupid, and they'll learn, you know. Yeah. I think um, that goes back to support the fact that relationships are the things that help people understand how to make a change or to make something more impactful. I mean, the, the people who are not going to listen to teachers when they make new laws or what or, or new standards or whatever I don't know how many teachers they're talking to right. about that you know so I think it all comes down to like we 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 bash social media for some things and then we see how great it can be yeah. for other things and I think if if there's always going to be this wall up that you know that prevents people from actually getting to know the people at the next level um in terms of, like, legislation and then everybody who has to respond to legislation, mm-hmm. it's not going to change if, if that doesn't become a priority or it doesn't, it's not more understood that, yeah. you know, knowing people and understanding them and having relationships with people like you do, they're, they're, the things aren't going to change. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Well, this has been goddamn fantastic. <laughs> any other closing comments from any of you? Keep grinding. Participate in the walkouts. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. All right. You guys stay safe in the schools, and uh, thank you guys for coming on. I really yeah, appreciate it. All right, it's been the Refined Savage. See ya. Hey, guys, one more thing before we go. I hope you're enjoying the show, and if you are, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. Stop in at our Instagram page, at Refined Savage Podcast, and like us there, and search for us on Facebook at the Refined Savage Podcast. Also, if you have a product or service you'd like to mention on the show, contact us at blinddoggym at gmail.com. Let's discuss your idea, and we'll see if we can help. Finally, if you love the show and want to see it continue, please consider donating to the show. A dollar an episode would be a huge help. Just head on over to blinddoggym.com, Look for that PayPal button where it says pay your dues and donate. Any amount helps. Thanks again for listening to the show. Now go on out there and do something awesome.